in today's program. It may seem very basic, but the Constitution lays out the separation of powers. Why? This is Constitution 101, and it is actually the greatest intellectual breakthrough of the Founding Fathers of the United States. It all goes back into the ancient world, Sam, Aristotle and Polybius. Polybius said, when he was writing about the constitutions of the ancient world, he said, there are governments by a king or a tyrant, there are aristocracies, and there are democracies. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses. So aristocracy, the rule of the few, democracy, the rule of everybody, and the kingship or tyranny, the rule of the one. And he, said, and he, and he went through it great detail to show what they can do and, and, and where they trip up. He said the best thing to do is to have elements of each of these three styles so that you get maximum efficiency and the least possible corruption and chaos. Well, that's sort of the basis of all of this. Then in Jefferson's time, a French political theorist by the name of Montesquieu, who is the most important intellectual behind our Constitution, he was never in America, but he wrote a famous book, The Spirit of the Laws, in 1748. He argued for separation of powers based on this insight by Polybius, the few, the many, and the one. So that's, that's the sort of the, the theoretical underpinning of it. But here's where the American people changed it. We don't have aristocracy in our Senate. Um, it's just another form of democracy, but it is of a fewer number of people. We don't have a monarch or a tyrant. We have a president who's constitutionally limited in his power. So we have the one, the few, and the many, those structures, but we have equalized them in terms of who gets in. The president can be anybody. He doesn't have to be you know, from the royal line of England. The Senate isn't necessarily made up of aristocrats. They're people like you and me who happen to become United States senators. So we have, a, we have an even social pool, theoretically, from which we draw these three different branches of government representing the one, the few, and the many. And the Founding Fathers were absolutely, um, completely aware of the history of these things. And James Madison, the father of the Constitution, knew his Montesquieu and his Polybius as well as anybody. And he decided, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a system. Because power can be corrupted so easily, we're going to split it up so that nobody has all of the power. And whoever is asserting power at any given moment can be thwarted, can be checked, or balanced by the other two branches. Um, what does it really all mean, though, as it applies to the 21st century? Well, let's say that uh, Congress passes a law to outlaw free speech during an international emergency. It passes both houses of Congress. Under a parliamentary system like the British system, that's now law. But here in our happy republic, the Supreme Court can say, wait a minute, that violates the First Amendment of the Constitution. We're striking it down. Or the president can say, I'm not going to enforce that law. That's a, that's a, a wicked and irresponsible law. I, I'm going to stand up to the Congress and speak on behalf of the Constitution. So it matters. Or let's say, I'll take another example. Let's say that uh, the Congress insists that the president uh, pull troops out of a war zone. The president says, I'm not doing it. Well, under our system of checks and balances and separation of powers, Congress can now withdraw funds. You can't have an army unless it's funded. They can pull the economic support at any time by a simple majority. Or they can impeach the president. And if he's convicted in the Senate, he's gone. So the president has lots of authority, but he's checked by the override of a veto in the Congress. He's checked by the Supreme Court. He's checked to a certain degree by public opinion. The judiciary has a great deal of authority, but it can only really do what it can enforce. Remember back in the famous um, uh, Indian cases in Georgia um, in the 19th century, Andrew Jackson was, was rebuked by the Supreme Court for the way he was treating Indians in the, in, the, in the area near Georgia. And he said, great, the court has made its decision. Now let them enforce it. You know, if he doesn't choose to listen, the court has no enforcement arm. They have no police. So each branch is separate in certain ways. It has a great deal of power, but it's never all powerful. The other two branches can strike back and, and reset the balance. And that is regarded by constitutional historians as, as 
the greatest bulwark the American people have against a runaway government. Let's talk about Nixon. <laughs> Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was an imperial president in the manner of Theodore Roosevelt, his hero. He actually began to think that he was above the law. And he, and he once said with a Freudian slip that when the president does something that's illegal, it's not illegal because he's the president. Well, it turns out that's not really true. So during the Watergate debacle, when Richard Nixon was trying to cover up those crimes, uh, it was discovered that there were White House tapes, that these conversations with Haldeman and Ehrlichman and John Dean had all been recorded by a secret White House taping system. And uh, the Congress and other courts demanded those tapes because they were important evidence about whether high crimes and misdemeanors had occurred. Richard Nixon refused to hand them over, and he said, no, the separation of powers doctrine, invoking this very doctrine, means that the president can't be compelled by the other two branches to yield, that there has to be some wall of autonomy that the executive has, otherwise there's no separation of powers. It's a compelling argument. But the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, said no. These tapes bear on extremely important matters with respect to crimes and also impeachment. Therefore, we are ordering you to hand over the tapes. We do not accept your invocation of the concept of executive privilege and separation of powers. We accept the principle, but it doesn't apply in this case. And in one of the, the great moments in the history of, of America, Sam, Richard Nixon handed over the tapes. He, he wouldn't have had to. The, the Congress couldn't have sent troops in to get those tapes. The Supreme Court couldn't have sent somebody over with a gun and said, hand them over. If, the, if President Nixon had decided he wasn't going to yield the tapes, the only remedy would be impeachment and conviction. So he, but he, just, he, he, loved, he loved the Constitution even more than he loved his crimes. And so he realized that he couldn't survive withholding the tapes. And so he reluctantly handed them over. But if the courts had said, you're entitled to them, on the separation of powers doctrine, he would not have handed them over. He would have said, that's a wall. Well, now, you have the situation with the Kennedy assassination where all the paperwork has been locked away for 50 years. Um, how does that play into this? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't play into the doctrine of separation of powers because there were agreements made um, uh, with the Warren Commission and with the Kennedy family that key documents, for whatever reason, would be sealed for this long period of time. That was not a separation of powers concern. It was a concern about national healing. There must be something in those papers that either would have been um, damaging to the Kennedys, in other words, just keeping this thing raw too long, or it would be damaging to our sense of America. You know, it's, that allows conspiracy theorists to believe that it was the CIA or it was the Mafia or it was the FBI or some combination of all of these. But the sense was that the American people need to get closure on this and move on and not dwell too long on this cataclysm. And so the papers were sealed. Whether that was a good or bad idea, I don't know. But it certainly has led to literally hundreds of books being published speculating on what we don't yet know. Here's a few questions to think about and discuss. Question one. Some people believe that the separation of powers doctrine might have made sense in Madison's America, but in the 21st century, it's too time consuming a system. Do you think we should change the Constitution to reflect modern life? Question two. In recent years, the executive branch has become more and more powerful, particularly during the war on terror. Is this good? Is it necessary? Is it dangerous? Question three. Since executive privilege is not based on explicit language in the Constitution, should it be scaled back or eliminated? Or is it implicit in the separation of powers doctrine? Question four. Thomas Jefferson believed that the legislative branch should be supreme because it's the branch closest to the people. Do you agree or disagree? Question five, why did the Founding Fathers think separation of powers was so important? Now, Thomas Jefferson was also involved in an executive decision. He was. He invoked executive privilege during the Aaron Burr treason trial. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but the sitting vice president of the United States, uh, Aaron Burr, uh, 
killed the former Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, in a duel, then fled away. Jefferson dropped him from his administration in the second term. But meanwhile, Burr was engaged in some sort of a conspiracy in the Old Southwest. And finally, Jefferson had him arrested and tried on a charge of high treason. And the, the person who sat in judgment of this circuit riding was Chief Justice John Marshall, who despised Jefferson and had thwarted Jefferson all the way along. And in the, the case ended with Burr's acquittal even though Jefferson had prejudiced the case nationally and said he, his guilt is beyond question, and he probably was guilty, but Marshall read the treason clause of the Constitution in so narrow a way that, that Burr couldn't be convicted. Well, at any rate, during that trial, Jefferson, even though he's the President of the United States, essentially acted as the chief prosecutor. and He, he, took, he micromanaged the whole thing from Washington, D.C., and tried with all of his might to get Burr convicted. Burr, in his defense, said he had to see papers that Jefferson had or he couldn't adequately defend himself. One of the rights that's guaranteed in the Fifth Amendment is that you have a right to face your accusers and to know the nature of the charges. He said, I can't defend myself unless we get these papers that happen to be held by the sitting president of the United States. So John Marshall issues a subpoena for the papers. What should Jefferson do? Jefferson said, I'm not giving you those papers, because to do so would violate the separation of powers doctrine. If the sitting president can be subpoenaed by X and Y and Z, then he can't do his work. And he has to be able to have confidential communications with his chief advisors. And if these are always being dragged into the public, the executive will not have the autonomy he needs to be the president of the United States. He said, I will not comply. Separation of powers, executive privilege. But, said Jefferson, in another great compromise, because I'm a good guy, I'm voluntarily going to send some papers to you. Not that you've compelled them, but that I choose to share with you. So don't think that I'm yielding, because I'm not. But I do want Burr to get a fair trial. So I am, out of the goodness of my heart, sending you some documents that you are not entitled to see. And Marshall wasn't happy. Burr wasn't happy but it allowed us to avoid a crisis because if Jefferson had said, I'm not doing it, there's no power that Marshall could have shown to compel Jefferson to turn over those papers. You can't send a U.S. Marshal to the White House. Okay, so when you talk about separation of powers, how separate are they really? Well, Madison, good, good question, Sam. Madison at the Constitutional Convention said, we want these departments to be separate, but we don't want them to be too separate. You know, we want them each to blend a little so that each can watch the others. And that's why the president has a qualified veto. Let's say Congress passes a law by 55% in both houses. The president vetoes it. Congress can override that veto. If the president had an absolute veto, he could prevent Congress from doing anything for four years. So they built in a blend. You have to have the separation of powers that the president can veto legislation. Otherwise, Congress could get out of control. But if it's, an un, if it's an absolute veto, the president can get out of control. So they blended the powers a little bit so that each one can check the other. That's sort of how it works. But historically speaking, uh, the power has all gone to the president of the United States. And here's what um, Clinton Rossiter has said, the president can make just about any use of such laws as he sees fit, and the people with their overt or silent resistance, not the courts, are the only practical limit to presidential power. Theoretically, if you look at the history of this, the presidency has swallowed up the other two branches in large part. Lincoln, during the Civil War, did things that were completely out of keeping with the idea of separation of powers. World War I, Woodrow Wilson, World War II, Franklin Roosevelt, each swallowed up the other two branches in large part. They chose not to strike back. And in fact, in most cases, the Supreme Court legitimized what the president had done. In Lincoln's case, the Congress legit, ex post facto went back and legitimized some of the confiscations and the, the spending habits that he had shown during the, the first part of the, uh, the Civil War crisis. So historically, the other two branches have yielded to the executive, and they have reduced the separation of powers almost to zero 
in times of emergency. But in times of peace, the other two branches sort of reassert themselves somewhat. Um, let's talk about Truman and what he did with U.S. Steel. There's a great example. During World War II, Franklin Roosevelt confiscated key industries. During the Civil War, Lincoln actually nationalized the railroads uh, without congressional authority. He just did it by executive order. So there's precedent for this. Well, the Korean War is going on, and there is a labor dispute in the steel industry. And if, the, if this goes to a strike, President Truman felt that we might not be able to supply the materiel to our troops over in Korea. So he said, if, if you don't settle this, I'm going to nationalize the steel industry and run it through the executive branch. The Supreme Court stepped in in a key case, uh, uh, which is uh, the, the, the Youngstown Steel and Tube Company case. The Supreme Court said, no, Congress could do that, but the president cannot do that. Now, it's hard to really understand this, Sam, because in World War II, Roosevelt did exactly this sort of thing, and Congress didn't stop him. But in this case, Truman attempted to do it, and the Supreme Court said, no, you have violated the separation of powers doctrine. That's a legislative act that you have taken on, and that's not what your branch, the executive, does. Yours puts laws into place. It executes laws, but it doesn't create law. You what have is, created law. But what does that really say to you? It says that it's a fluid system, that there's a lot of flexibility in it. And a president like Theodore Roosevelt or Franklin Roosevelt, who's immensely popular and uses the bully pulpit well and has an air of great confidence and has the people behind him, can do just about anything. Or in a time of unprecedented emergency, say the Depression or the Civil War, the people look to their president and want him to be essentially a benevolent dictator. But if you come down from, the, from, a, from a profound crisis to something more normal like the Korean War, then the people are not so willing to let this happen and the other branches are more protective of their historic constitutional validity. So it's really flexible and a president never knows. A president never really can tell. Remember Bill Clinton, when he was sued by Paula Corbin Jones on a sexual harassment suit, um, claimed executive privilege and said, the president, the sitting president can't be hectored by disgruntled people the Supreme Court said, no, uh, you've got time to handle this. This is not something that's, we don't have to wait till you leave office for this. We will grant her the capacity to sue you because she's not suing you for your official behavior. She's suing you for your private behavior. If, if you had done something, signed an executive order, she couldn't sue you for that. That's separation of powers. That's the, the executive privilege of the president. But because it, this is about your private sexual life, has nothing to do with your performance as president of the United States, we can't put up a shield for you. So it's fluid. If President Clinton had been at the height of his powers, or if it had been an international emergency like that of World War II or 9-11, probably the courts would have said, he's way too important to they be. They wouldn't have even considered it. Right, so it's all fluid, and you have to, you know, as you know, you do this all the time, masterful, politicians know how to read situations and to know what they can get away with. Classical point, Theodore Roosevelt sent the great white fleet around the world on the greatest circumnavigation in human history without congressional assistance of any sort. He didn't even inform his cabinet. He unilaterally, as the President of the United States, deployed the entire fleet of the United States on the most ambitious journey in the history of navies without consulting Congress, the Naval Department, or his cabinet. He just did it. And he got away with it. And a senator came to him and said, you can't do that. You, you had no authority to do that. And Roosevelt said, look, there's enough money in the budget to send the fleet to the Philippines. If you want it back, I assume you will appropriate more. And <laughs> they had to fold their tent because he was so powerful, so charismatic, so popular, that the other branches didn't really dare check him. Here's some more discussion questions. Question six. Can you think of examples where the separation of powers doctrine has simply broken down? Question seven. 
how much power should the courts, including the Supreme Court, have in determining whether the actions of the other two branches are constitutional? Question 8. Should the President have a line item veto? Question 9. Should the President be able to impound funds appropriated by Congress, that is, refuse to spend them even though Congress passed laws to spend the money? Question 10. Would impeachment or the threat of impeachment be a useful mechanism in reining in the power of the presidency? The separation of powers worked very well when there appeared to be not that much at stake, but in a world of cruise missiles. Is its time gone? Yes and no. I mean, I do think that everyone now agrees that the president has to have really extraordinary authority in a crisis like World War II or the, the aftermath of 9-11. And even though uh, the presidents in those situations do more than they're constitutionally entitled to do and the, the system of checks and balances largely breaks down, I mean, I think we all understand that we live in the real world, not in a kind of a civics textbook, and that the, the, the circumstances of the 21st century are such that we need way less separation than the Founding Fathers would have liked. I think and that's only going to get worse. I think that the technologies of communication, surveillance, weaponry, terrorism are such that the President will just grow and grow and grow in power. And, and let me say, I predict that the Bill of Rights will have a very rough 21st century because those protections were 18th century protections when these technologies didn't exist and America was a kind of lovely island separated from the rest of the world. We may, we may have entered a post-enlightenment phase, but it still matters. And let me give you an example. This is my favorite Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson. He comes, he's in the 50s. He's in the time of Eisenhower and Truman. He says this. It's quite interesting. As created, the Supreme Court seemed too anemic to endure a long contest for power, he writes. Yet in spite of its apparently vulnerable position as the weakest third branch of government, the court has repeatedly overruled and thwarted both the Congress and the executive. It has been an angry collision with the most dynamic and popular presidents in our history. Jefferson retaliated with impeachment. Andrew Jackson denied its authority. Lincoln disobeyed a writ of the Chief Justice. Theodore Roosevelt, after his presidency, proposed recall of judicial decisions. Wilson tried to liberalize its membership, and Franklin D. Roosevelt proposed to reorganize the courts. And yet, it is su surprising that it should not only survive, but with no might except the moral force of its judgments should attain actual supremacy as a source of our constitutional dogma. In other words, the system still works, that if Congress tomorrow decided that it doesn't want to fund any of America's wars. It could withdraw the money, and the president would have no choice but to bring the troops home. If the Supreme Court strikes down um, the behavior of the United States in the world court, or through its laws, or its interrogation, there is ample evidence that the administration, uh, any administration, would in most respects acquiesce so that the checks and balances still are important the threat of them is important, and even in reality, they tend to work. When, when the courts demanded that Nixon turn over the tapes, he did. When the courts said that our um, regimen at Guantanamo was in violation of international agreements, we had to change that regimen. Uh, there's a very interesting way in which separation of powers still matters in spite of the intuitive sense we have that the, the executive has to be very, very powerful. But does it not mean that they are effective, but just further after the fact than perhaps they were before. This always happens. You know, after, during the Civil War, um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, in, a, in, a, in a celebrated case, uh, said that Lincoln had violated uh, writs of habeas corpus and that he, shame on him, and Lincoln just ignored him. But after the war was over and peace had returned, the court returned to this issue and won a victory over the executive. In World War II, when Franklin Roosevelt locked up Japanese Americans in what have to be called concentration camps, the courts acquiesced. But when the war had been successfully won, the courts stepped in and said, no more, and you went too far. So we do have a kind of after-the-fact way of restoring these things. But the country, 
is enormously flexible, and the people do get it, that there are things at stake that are higher than constitutional niceties. The question is, I mean, we haven't been faced with a real tyrant. What if Nixon had kept the tapes and had refused, even upon conviction, to leave office? What if a president of the United States voided the next election and declared martial law? What if, you know, you can spin out hypotheticals, but we have not yet been tested with the big problem of when a presidency or a legislature spins so far out of control that they're, the attempts to check it by constitutional means are impotent, and suddenly we either have to face tyranny or we have to rise up in rebellion. We, we have never been fundamentally tested in this regard. So at this point, we have not risen to the point of a monarchy or a hyper-presidency? Very close. The president has absolutely enormous powers. But the Congress still has the power of the purse. And as long as the Congress has the power of the purse, it would take a constitutional coup d'etat for the president to spend money that Congress has not authorized them to spend. You know, the government did shut down, remember, during uh, Bill Clinton's administration, came to an impasse over the budget, a continuing resolution wasn't passed, and the government actually shut down. It, it shocked me when it happened, but federal workers were told to go home. We, we can't pay you. There is no money. And so the system does have this tripartite separation concept in it, and it still has some bones. The problem is it's so covered with fatty tissue and uh, the, the rise of a kind of a mediated hyper-presidency that we don't see it very often. But the question is, will it ever spin out of control so far that there's a real knockdown, drag out quarrel between the three branches? And what happens if the president doesn't blink or Congress doesn't blink? We don't know what that zone is, but we shouldn't think, Sam, that we will always do this well. The history of the world, from the Roman Republic to the British Empire to the, the fall of Louis the Sixteenth, the history of the world is reaching a fundamental crisis where the rule of law can't solve the problem. And we should not think that we are immune to this. Um, as Americans, we've been blessed for more than 200 years with a peaceful culture. We cannot guarantee that there won't be a time when that breaks down. As we observe over our lifetimes, to be continued. Thomas Jefferson said, eternal vigilance is the price of human happiness, that the, the, the people have to watch their government like a hawk every minute. And if you go to sleep, do not assume that your government will continue to be benign. Thank you.